Mountaineering, a pursuit of reaching the highest points on Earth, has always been associated with the spirit of exploration and the challenge of human limits. However, the increasing popularity of high altitude climbing has brought to light a pressing issue, overcrowding on mountains. This issue is not only altering the essence of mountaineering, but also raising serious ethical questions, especially when tragedies occur, as seen on K2. In recent years, K2, the world's second highest peak, has seen a surge in the number of climbers attempting to reach its summit. Reports from the 2022 climbing season describe scenes of conga lines at the infamous bottleneck Kular, with over 100 climbers reaching the summit on a single day. The year 2022 marked a record with 207 permits issued, and estimates for 2024 suggest around 200 to 250 permits. Such numbers are staggering when compared to the mountain's history, where in previous years, only a few dozen might attempt the summit. As more and more people crowd onto mountains like K2, tragic accidents occur more frequently, and among these tragedies is that of Ali Akbar Saki. This is his story. Ali Akbar Saki was a passionate and ambitious mountaineer from Afghanistan, known for his remarkable achievements in high altitude climbing. Born in the Doshi district of Baglan province, Saki had an outstanding track record in mountaineering, which included successfully reaching Na Shak Peak, the highest mountain in Afghanistan, after a challenging 17-day ascent. By the age of 36, Saki had climbed several high altitude peaks, but his aspirations led him to set his sights on even more formidable mountains. The start of the 2022 climbing season was highly anticipated and an exciting time. The world was just getting out of a two-year pandemic where most global travel was highly restricted. This led to many expeditions fighting over the small spaces on any 8000er in K2 was no different. On July 20th, 2022, a lot was happening on the Abruzzi Spur route. The mountain is notorious for being one of the most difficult 8,000 meter peaks to climb. The shoulder where Camp 3 is located was extremely busy. Even though the wind was strong and the weather looked bad, the forecast predicted things would get better soon. Many Sherpas were on their way up to the tippity top and tons of climbers flowing were trekking camps three and four. All were hoping for nicer weather in the coming days. Saki was one of those climbers. He had joined a group called Karakoram Expeditions led by Mizra Ali. According to his wife, Saki had spent a lot of money to be there, about 40,000 US dollars. That money covered three oxygen bottles for the last push to the summit, got him a guide to help him along the way, and most importantly, a spot on the mountain. Saki was helped by a guide named Dalit Muhammad. Even though Saki had experience with tall mountains before, he did not want to cut costs and desired an experienced Sherpa with him for his climb. However, this would not be the case as Muhammad had never been on K2 before and there was simply nobody else to help. Saki had been moving slowly during his acclimatization climbs. But what was more worrisome is that since the beginning of the expedition, he had developed a cough that would not go away. Many others noticed how slow his practice climbs were, and some remarks were made that Saki was not in the correct condition to climb. Despite this, he insisted on joining the final push to the summit, as he felt up for the task. On the morning of July 20th, before leaving Camp 2, Saki sent a message to his wife, saying he felt good, but as he made his way to Camp 3, something went wrong. At 10.35 AM, Saki recorded a video on his phone while they waited for supplies. He said they were above Camp 2, and his climbing buddy's suit had ripped, which was causing their delay. However, Saki continued to be very slow after leaving Camp 2, so slow, in fact, that Muhammad would suggest they go back to Camp 2. But Saki did not accept this, and wanted to keep going. In another video from Saki's phone, he said that climbing K2 isn't easy, especially with a porter who's never been there before. Saki explained that because the porter didn't know the timing well, they had got stuck in a storm, and they were doing their best to get out of the tough situation and praying to God for help. <laughs> Oh, 
for me. But as time passed, no help would come. The weather kept getting worse as the sun set below the sky. They were approximately 7,050 meters high up on K2, surrounded by howling winds as a fierce blizzard screamed around them. Saki was struggling to move and didn't want to go back down, but Muhammad saw no other option. The storm made everything worse. Saki became so exhausted from the climb and weather that he couldn't move up or down anymore. Saki and his guide sat on a ledge, facing the harsh blizzard as snow whirled around them. Saki's cough, which had been there since the start, was getting worse, possibly indicating high altitude sickness. While coughing is normal in the dry mountain air, Saki's cough was unrelenting, which was never a good sign. While stuck under the deadly conditions and alone with one's thoughts, Saki revealed to his guide for the first time that he had heart issues. This is not something that you should keep to yourself when trying to climb an 8000er. As the hours passed, their health deteriorated and the weather worsened. Saki's guide decided he could no longer sit there and set out to Camp 3 to seek help. Due to the harsh conditions, there was no visibility on the mountain as Muhammad traversed multiple feet of snow, eventually reaching to Camp 3. At Camp 3, Karakoram Expeditions had assembled a big team, including a group of porters assisting Samina Beg in her quest to reach the summit. Samina, the sister of Mirza Ali, the owner of Karakoram Expeditions, was on her third attempt to conquer K2. She was determined to make history as the first Pakistani woman to reach its summit. That evening, everyone in the team knew that Saki hadn't made it to Camp 3. Michael Pfeiffer from Denmark, a member of the team, shared on Facebook that the last climber hadn't arrived at Camp 3. Due to harsh weather, a proper search couldn't be conducted, so they spent the night crammed into crowded tents, battling extreme winds with little sleep. The strong wind and bad weather would not last all night, as there was a break around 11pm. The eerie, quiet night was a stark contrast to mere hours before. On the morning of July 21st, the weather was perfect. While most of the expedition team kept climbing to the top, two porters descended from Camp 3. However, they weren't going to look for Saki. Instead, they were tasked with helping another climber, Michael Pfeiffer. Michael, alone with two high-altitude porters, began their descent from Camp 3 at around 7 a.m. They had decided to not go for the summit, as one of the high-altitude porters was a strong climber but was showing signs of altitude sickness. As they descended the mountain, they did not expect to find anyone, but after 30 minutes into their climb, they came across Saki. Despite spending the night out in the harsh weather, surrounded by snow at about 7,150 meters, he was still alive. Saki, unfamiliar with the landscape of K2, didn't know Camp 3 was nearby. Word of his location was given to base camp and then spread to the various camps on the mountain. As per the Karakoram Expedition's report, Arshad, the most senior guy, and Dalit descended to help Saki, while other team members arrived a bit earlier and provided him with water, cheese, and chocolate. Surprisingly, he seemed to be okay. The day progressed slowly as the men tried to make Saki more comfortable, but would note that he kept making comments about his heart. But after Saki began to recover, they were faced with another problem, the actual climbing route on K2. Pfeiffer's main worry was getting Saki down the Black Pyramid, a deadly traverse. Saki said he could do it, but Pfeiffer doubted him. The men, with no other option left, began preparing Saki for the traverse. With artificial oxygen, the two high-altitude portals struggled to move him very far. After about 50 meters of climbing, Saki collapsed on the rope, unresponsive. Sadly, he had collapsed and passed away from heart failure. Additional climbers arrived at this moment to help out, but they were too late. There was nothing more that anyone could do, and even less could be said. Saki had managed to get through the steep parts of the Black Pyramid and had reached the last steep area with soft snow above. Pfeiffer confirmed they were very close to Camp 3 before Saki collapsed. If they had made it to Camp 3, then it's possible the supplies, oxygen, and medication could have helped him, but nobody will ever know for certain. While Samina and most of the Karakoram expedition team continued to Camp 4, Samina reached the summit on the morning of July 22nd, joining around 145 other climbers who achieved the feat that day. She was accompanied by six high-altitude porters. On their descent to base camp, they passed the body of Ali Akbar Saki. 
Another climber admitted that Saki's body was near the fixed ropes, visible to everyone descending from Camp 3 and being passed by on their own journeys. Nala Kiani, who was climbing K2 for the first time after summoning her first 8,000 meter peak, Gasherbrum II, in 2021, had faced a tragic loss before the expedition. Her climbing teacher and mentor, Ali Raza, who was supposed to guide her on K2, had died in a rock climbing accident just weeks before. In shock, Kiani ended up climbing with Sirbaz Khan. Khan, who was focused on completing the 14 8,000 meter peaks, hadn't initially planned to climb K2 that year. However, he decided to go as a tribute to Raza, who had mentored him. On July 21st, while on their way to Camp 3, with a large group of climbers, they spotted Saki lying on the snow. He had collapsed right in front of Khan, who was climbing about 30 minutes ahead. As Kiani approached, she zoomed in with her phone to see what was happening. She noticed a small Afghani flag falling towards her, which she grabbed, realizing it belonged to Saki. Kiani recorded the video at 11 a.m., so she estimates Khan met Saki around 10.30 a.m. when Saki was at approximately 7,100 meters. According to Michael Pfeiffer's report, they found Saki 50 vertical meters higher, indicating he had managed to walk down another 50 meters before collapsing. Kiani admits that when Khan reached Saki, he became very emotional. He wanted to perform CPR, hoping Saki was still alive. But Kiani's climbing group included Dr. Richard Cartier, who checked Saki and confirmed that there was nothing more they could do. According to Kiani, Khan and Arshad performed the last rites for Saki, praying, closing his eyes, and covering his head with the hood of his down suit. They took charge of moving Saki's body down the mountain because the two porters who had come down from Camp 3 were overwhelmed. Kiani said that Khan moved Saki's body for over two hours to 7,000 meters and secured it to a rock. Kiani and Khan later continued their climb and summited Gasherbrum 1. However, Kiani hasn't been able to forget the traumatic experience on K2. She posted a solemn report on her Instagram, including her team's role in helping to remove Saki's body from the route. Ali Akbar Saki was striving to become the first Afghan climber to summit an 8,000 meter peak. He also aimed to promote Afghanistan's Hindu Kush mountains. As a successful entrepreneur and IT consultant, he was actively involved in charity work. He was well liked at base camp, with one climber saying basically everybody liked him. The reports raised some questions about Saki's condition, the guide's abilities, and an overcrowding issue with inexperienced climbers on the peak. But the most pressing question left unanswered is why. With a large support team waiting at Camp 3, no one was able to help Saki. Instead, he was left exposed in the open throughout the entire night. Similarly, in July 2023, Muhammad Hassan, a 27-year-old Pakistani porter, fell while setting up ropes for climbers. A video surfaced showing climbers stepping over Hassan as he lay dying. In fact, I did a video at the time covering his entire story. The deaths of Saki and Hassan underscore a troubling trend, the abandonment of climbers in distress. The drive to reach the summit, coupled with the sheer number of climbers, can lead to a depersonalization of the risks involved. When every climber is focused on their own goal, the spirit of camaraderie and mutual assistance that has long been a hallmark of mountaineering can be lost. The question of blame in the wake of a climber's death on K2 it's complex. While individual decisions play a role, there is a collective responsibility within the mountaineering community to address the underlying issues of overcrowding and its consequences. It is imperative to find a balance between the desire for adventure and the preservation of the mountains and the safety of all those who climb them.